Oh, howdy all, grab yourself a drink. It is time for some Path of Exile discussion. Patch 3.20 is coming reasonably soon, about three weeks time, and Grinding Gear Games today provided a balanced manifesto. This is the third in the series, and I've got videos down below on numbers one and two. For a balanced manifesto that contains nerfs, I'm surprised that this one has been as well received as it has been. This one's one that's looking at one of the rippiest and also most rewarding parts of gameplay in 3.19 or 3.18 before that, or 3.17 before that, and that is the Eldritch Altars system. These are added in patch 3.17. They allow you to juice up maps considerably, causing them to add a whole bunch of extra packs into them, and also causing a lot of really, really dangerous debuffs on players, many of which can get you killed, but also will provide a lot of loot. This system is not being rebuilt from the ground up, but a number of changes are being made that are gonna be pretty impactful. So let's go through everything here. So firstly, there's a number of changes to Altar Rewards. The first thing is that GGG consider Eldritch Altars currently so rewarding that they're stopping players from wanting to engage in content that's not in maps like Delve or Heist and the like. Because of this, Grinding Gear Games are going to be lightly nerfing the top end rewards from Altars. Now when I say top end rewards, this is going to be a more considerable nerf the more aggressively you are focused on scaling Altars as much as possible. So if you were running Wrath of the Cosmos and Eldritch Gaze before, then you're going to see this as a fairly significant nerf. But if you weren't running with both of those keystones, or if you were running with neither of them, then it's going to be much smaller. There's also a number of other updates to those rewards, some of which are significant, some of which are not. A number of options are being removed from these altars. These are duplicating gems, influenced items, unique items, gems, and maps. Now, with the exception of maps, these were almost always rubbish. They were generally things you didn't want to pick. This means that other reward types will take their place, and as a result will be more common than they are now. Alters will no longer offer a choice for basic currency without describing what that basic currency is going to be, but instead they'll offer choices for specific currency. For example, instead of seeing alters that say map boss drops three basic currency items, you'll now see an alter that says something like map boss drops three additional Val orbs, or if you're very lucky, map boss drops two additional divine orbs or something like that. Currency rewards from influence minions no longer drop in stacks. Some of the very common, very low value currency rewards are going to be removed from this basic currency reward. I think in general, from a raw currency perspective, this seems like a buff overall, although we'll have to play test it to see. There are going to be a number of changes for Scarab and Divination card rewards, and they'll be more specific. So for example, instead of it saying you're getting Divination cards, you'll see things like Divination cards, which reward unique jewelry, which if you're very lucky is a doctor. And if you're less lucky, as you normally will be, it'll be a divination card more like hubris. Now these specific currency scarab and divination card rewards will be split so that they are exclusive to one altar type. So if you want to chase a specific type of reward, you'll be able to more deterministically farm that. And whilst you're not going to be guaranteed to get it all the time, it's going to be something you'll be able to work towards over time somewhat. That will provide players some agency in SSF if they want to chase a medium rarity unique item that has a divination card for it, you can then try and find the appropriate influence type to go for it. The rewards that still remain are going to be currency, scarabs, div cards, duplicate currency, duplicate uniques, duplicate scarabs, duplicate maps, and duplicate divination cards, as well as the quantity rarity hybrid mod. To give a specific example, if you run maps influenced by the Eater of Worlds, you'll see divine orbs from the basic currency reward more than twice as often as before. And I assume that that means that the Searing Exarch would have exalted orbs instead as the replacement there. On the whole, Scarabs will be offered a lot less than before from Altars, but wait. We don't want them to be too scarce in general. As such, we're adding Rusted Scarabs to the core drop pool. We're adding a vendor recipe that can be used to upgrade Scarabs between tiers using the 3 to 1 ratio, but this caps out at Gilded Scarabs. We're also going to be adding an upgrade button in the Fragment Stash tab that will upgrade your Scarabs for you, similar to the upgrade functionality in the Essence Stash tab. I think this is going to be a huge change. Just getting Scarabs dropping in regular gameplay means that there'll be a lot more available. You won't need to play specific things in order to get them. You'll get them while you're playing the game normally, and then you can decide what you're gonna do with them. You can use the Horizon Orb recipe. You can use the three for one recipe. They have a whole lot of options. The next section of the manifesto addresses boss rushing, which is one of those things where a very powerful way to play the game becomes boring quickly. It doesn't have very much staying power, and as a result, GGG are going out of their way to nerf it a little bit. So players currently have an incentive to skip past all regular map monsters and kill the map boss first. The motivation for doing so is that altars which will offer rewards affecting the map boss are less desirable right now. By killing the boss first, you eliminate those options from your map altars, 
which makes them more rewarding. In one of those cases where the most efficient and rewarding gameplay strategy undermines the expected gameplay loop and encourages players to do things that aren't really fun, like run straight to the boss on a Mesa map or a Foundry map where you know exactly where the boss is going to be. We're making a few numerical changes to alter rewards so that choices that affect boss drops or influence monster drops are more comparably valuable, though boss drop rewards will be slightly better on average than Eldritch Minion rewards. Really interested to see how this turns out. This way, it's going to be back to you probably wanting to kill the entire map in most situations. Eldritch Alter linked monster packs are going to be getting nerfed somewhat here. This is not a gutting sweeping nerf, it is a modest one. The amount of influence packs that are spawned by Eldritch influence maps has been reduced by about a third, but the chance of influence alters spawning has been increased by about half to somewhat offset this. We're making this change to add some variance to alter gameplay. Previously, Eldritch influence maps would always spawn exactly 60 packs, 6-0 within a map. They'll now spawn somewhere between 20 and 60 packs per map. It's a large enough variance that the difference should be very notable, and it should also encourage more decision making around alters. For example, if you intuit that it's a 20 pack map, you might be more inclined to pick map and boss modifiers as there won't be as many influenced monsters in the map to get other rewards from. And at the same time as this, GGG are changing the way that these packs spawn. Instead of all eight types of monsters for a particular influence being an option, there'll only be three, and they'll be three across the map. So for instance, with the Eater of Worlds, if you don't get the Tentacle Miscreations in your first three packs and you get three different things, then you know there's going to be no technical miscreations in that map. This wasn't intended as a power change, this was intended to make areas feel more different to each other. We'll see how that goes. Rotha Cosmos is being rebuilt from the ground up. This is an incredibly dangerous thing you could do to your maps, but it wasn't entirely immediately obvious why the maps were so much more dangerous. For example, if you allocate the perfect storm and then you fight Cirrus and you get absolutely and utterly crushed, you know exactly why you failed that Cirrus, it's because you allocated the perfect storm, jumped the area up to level 85 and face the uber version, and you weren't ready for that yet. But on the flip side, if you allocate Wrath of the Cosmos, it can feel fine for a little while, until you do a map that has 5 altars in it rather than the typical 2 or 3, and in this one you just start taking staggering amounts of damage. Having 125% increase the amount of damage your character suffers is absolutely off the charts ridiculous. So that's what the old Wrath of the Cosmos did. The problem was that it was so powerful loot-wise, the players that were okay with dying quite a lot to one-shots were taking it anyway, and then they were recommending it to all their friends, people would copy an atlas tree without realising just how much danger they were signing up for when they allocated those nodes. Anyways, Wrath of the Cosmos is being completely and utterly reworked. It is now going to only affect altars in maps that are influenced by the Searing Exarch. Each altar now has a 50% chance for an additional upside, and when they have an additional upside, the downside will be doubled in effect. The overall risk versus reward nature of the keystone is still in place, it's just a lot less intense now. The Eldritch Gaze keystone now only affects altars in maps influenced by the Eater of Worlds. The main reason for this is that we want you to invest Atlas passives into the influence type you're currently farming, rather than feeling compelled to take both of them at once. And just to explicitly call a spade a spade, this is a nerf to how much you can scale your reward from those keystones if you're one of the subset of players who were taking both in the past. The thing was that in order to take both of them in the past, you kind of needed to have an extraordinary level of defense on your character. We're not just talking Aegis Aurora and Melding of the Flesh, we're talking Mage Blood as well. That was pretty much necessary in order to use that full setup properly and not be dying all the time. What was happening was that the players who had that full setup and also had both Wrath of the Cosmos and Eldritch Gaze were able to get a lot, lot, lot more loot per hour because they were able to do these super rippy maps without dying very much, whereas players that just had the Aegis Aurora and the Melding of the Flesh but not the Mage Blood weren't really able to run this without dying a lot, and of course players that didn't have any of those powerful items were dying all the time in them. Conclusion, Alter Rewards are a bit more sensible now through clearer reward types and through toning down the extreme levels of giftiness. We're working towards making it so that players don't feel compelled to rush straight to map bosses in order to maximise their rewards, we updated Wrath of the Cosmos to be less brutal and a bit less rewarding. The intent wasn't to gut those systems, just to slightly reduce their overall potency, and they should still be valuable sources of rewards. The other thing that's drawn a lot of discussion in this manifesto is that there is going to be a chance for Maven witnessed map bosses to drop an awakened gem. I expect that this will be a very small chance for these to drop, but it's still going to be there, and it's something that's going to be an extra little bonus that's going to add up over time, and it's going to encourage players who are able to do it 
to run cycles where they run, for example, all the Shaper Guardians while they're influenced, or all of the Conquerors while they're influenced, then run the Maven's Invitation that we fight those bosses, and then keep repeating this cycle with new maps. It could be interesting to see how this compares to Searing Exarch and Eater of Worlds influence when we get a bit of a chance to play around with it. Lastly, I think this is going to have an interesting effect on the Trade League economy, not necessarily a good one either. This is going to cause a crash in the price of Awakened Gems, which is then going to make the Maven fight much, much, much more dependent upon the very, very rare Uber Maven exclusive Awakened in Power, Awakened in Lighten, and Awakened Enhanced supports. These gems that are very, very expensive and very, very rare and only drop from the Uber version of the fight, these are going to be the only reason to run the Maven in a mature league, and I don't know that that's going to feel all that good in play. That said, willing to give it a shot for a league and see how it works out. That's all I got on this. Mega Valobs have interesting results, and I will see you around.